I'm here today with uh, Dr. Richard Stramko, and this is our 22nd live event. Uh, the topic today, December 17th, 2020, is frontotemporal dementia and other frontal lobe syndromes. So uh, in a nutshell, a damage to the nerve cells in the frontal lobe or the front part of the brain can cause a number of different front frontotemporal disorders, including frontotemporal dementia, but many of the other dementias may also include damage to the frontal lobe. So uh, in today's live event, uh, we wanted to walk through some of the important concepts related to the frontal lobes or the front part of the brain and what kinds of signs and symptoms may develop in people with frontotemporal dementia or other dementias affecting the front part of the brain. So we'll walk through a bit of the anatomy and uh, we'll talk a little bit about frontotemporal dementia specifically, and then we will get to your live question and answer. So if you're watching the event on Facebook, you can post your questions in the comments area on Facebook. If you're watching it on our iGeriCare site on iGeriCare.ca slash events, then you have a little chat bot that you can use to post your questions. Uh, and uh, thank you to all of the viewers who have um, sent in your questions in advance via email. We will try our best uh, to get through it. So. Uh, without further ado, my esteemed colleague, Dr. Richard Stramko, coming to you live from Hamilton Health Sciences, part of McMaster University's Academic Health Science Centers. How are you doing Hi. today? I'm great. Good to see you as always, Anthony. All right. Well, let's uh, dive in there. Again, uh, uh, we've, we always state this, dementia is uh, an umbrella term. Even frontotemporal dementia turns out to be a bit of an umbrella term because there are several different types of dementia uh, that may impact uh, the frontal lobes. Um, but I'm going to let you talk a bit about uh, the frontal lobes, and I'm just going to um, put up an image of the brain while you, uh, while you talk about that. Sure. So the frontal lobes are definitely, the frontal lobe is actually the largest uh, lobe um, in terms of brain function. And um, it's responsible for quite a lot of what makes you, you. So uh, your motivation and desire, your ability to perform goal-directed activities and kind of get up off the couch and get engaged in life. Um, that would be uh, localized to the interior cingulate part of the brain. We haven't showed that specifically here. And uh, we'll try not to get too technical, but um, having interpersonal warmth and relatedness. Um, so being able to understand and empathize with other human beings and understand if they're experiencing pain or suffering uh, and wanting to be involved in their lives. That's an important part of the, the frontal lobes. Um, understanding appropriate manners and kind of social rules and having social graces. Um, understanding how we interact with other people in professional contexts or, you know, um, understanding when it's appropriate to be personal and when it's appropriate to be professional and uh, appreciating the differences between those various contexts and choosing the right set of um, uh, manners to, to employ. Uh, that's an important part. Um, language as well. So being able to uh, understand what objects are, understand how to relate the names to those objects and what the functions of objects are, being able to uh, articulate certain words and produce speech. So th there's a really broad category here of, of what the frontal lobes are accomplishing. And, you know, we'll contrast that to something like Alzheimer's disease, which involves more predominantly the temporal lobes and the back part of the brain or the parietal lobes. And those people are having issues with memory and their visuospatial functions are impacted more and at different parts of the language center. So, um, you know, they're, they're quite different in terms of the, the signs and symptoms you might see depending on where the damage is happening. Um, it's, in it's really an amazing um, part of the brain with, uh, really, as you can see, like a huge range of functions. And I think as, as you put it as well, there are a lot of people that feel that compared to other species, uh, other mammals, uh, the front part of the brain and the frontal lobes are larger in humans. And so a lot of people do describe, you know, the, a lot of the frontal lobe functions as 
kind of uh, essential for what makes us human, I including one of the things that you alluded to, which is this notion of executive function. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we often talk about is it it's almost like a control central executive function uh, with higher order tasks like uh, organization and planning. And so um, a lot of times when people are presenting with changes to the frontal lobes, uh, we see some of the things related to uh, executive dysfunction. What are, what are some of those things that we sometimes will, will see in patients with uh, frontotemporal dementias? That's a great point. And so um, you mentioned kind of planning, organizing, sequencing of events. So how am I going to solve a problem? And if it's a complex problem, you have multiple steps. So how to take the appropriate steps in the right in the right order? Um, kind of more abstract concepts um, of time, um, uh, being able to multitask. So having multiple things on the go at one time, driving is, for instance, one of those things, and then being able to switch back and forth between different tasks. So kind of ending one thing that you're working on and moving on to a next, to, to the next. And so I think those are most likely in terms of symptoms going to be reflected in somebody's instrumental activities of daily living. So finances are complex, complicated tasks that require a lot of executive function cooking and doing complex meals or cooking uh, a complex meal requires a lot of executive function driving i mean our, our previous live event was talking about that as a super executive function or super cognitive function so uh, those are the kind of day-to-day -day activities where people will have that impacted most so let uh let's talk a little bit about um frontotemporal dementia as a as a category, uh, and then maybe we can break down a little more some of the, the different conditions that uh, might be characterized as frontotemporal dementias. Mm -hmm. So as you see here, it's, um, it's less common uh, than Alzheimer's disease, although that does, uh, and other dementias, it does change when people are younger, and uh, that's mm -hmm. one of the assessments we do. So if people are presenting at a younger age and they're um, 50s and early 60s, then it would make a frontotemporal dementia a lot, a lot more common. Um, the changes we were talking about, so the the, the um, functions of the frontal lobe are impacted early in the disease course, and the symptoms are more severe. So somebody, for instance, might have some mild apathy where they uh, aren't don't have quite the amount of get up and go, or they might sit on the couch for a little bit longer than they normally would, whereas somebody that presents uh, with a behavioral variant frontal temporal dementia and has apathy, they could have been a high functioning CEO, you know, within the last nine to 12 months and they're flying all over the place and they have a high, high powered job. And then they start withdrawing quite significantly and they are stopped going to work and they start, uh, stop engaging with kind of day-to-day -day activities around the home. So the apathy is quite severe, more prominent and same with the, um, the personality changes. So, um, you know, having that lack of interpersonal warmth or lack of caring for people around mm -hmm. them, you'll, you'll notice it uh, most strikingly, I think, with grandchildren and with pets, right? Those are things that are easy to see. Somebody has a love for their pet and a love for their grandkids. And all of a sudden they start losing interest in what their grandchildren are up to, or perhaps even what their spouse is up to. If something bad happens to somebody they care about, they're not very engaged or they don't very care much. And so they can be described as um, cold or unfeeling in those situations. Um, uh, and, and maybe maybe just with with the the nomenclature and uh, you know, you mentioned that term behavior, behavioral variant frontal to uh, temporal dementia. Maybe just talk a little bit about the different types of frontotemporal dementia and, and some of the other terms that uh, people might hear, because there are some different um, uh, terms, medical terms, and different types of dementias or causes of frontotemporal dementia. That makes sense. I, was, I just, did just lose my train of thought there for a second, but I will I'll finish on a couple of the other prominent symptoms of the, the cognitive side of things. So the hyperorality is mentioned here. Um, that means people putting things in their mouth more commonly or having carbohydrate cravings. So they can't 
shut themselves off from eating lots of snacks, chocolates, chips. They may eat until the point where they throw up and then will continue to eating. So it's, it's something that's quite obvious sometimes when, um, when it's uh, happening. Um, so we mentioned the apathy, the empathy, the disinhibition. So people will start to say things that are inappropriate for the context. They may become more sexually suggestive in work contexts, um, which is inappropriate. They, you know, may comment on somebody's ugly shirt when it's not an appropriate place to do that. They'll be over familiar in professional contexts. So some of my patients will be talking to me like I'm their best friend when it's a patient provider relationship. Um, so I think that's- I would, I would say this, this particular symptom of uh, disinhibition or inappropriateness, inappropriate behavior, whether it's uh, sexual, uh, it's it's probably one of the most distressing symptoms for the family friend care partners or caregivers that we would see. And it, it's also, as you say, uh, this often occurs at younger onset. So you have people who are in the workplace who may be saying or doing things inappropriately. Uh, they, they are potentially saying things that they might normally have never said or would be inc incredibly embarrassed about. But yeah. because of their apathy or lack of emotion about it, they don't generally have an awareness that they're uh, saying or doing these things that are uh, so mortifying sometimes for the family members. Uh, I, I absolutely agree uh, with you. And even in the context of an assessment and you're giving somebody a really terrifying diagnosis, the family me members can be very distraught, but the patient themselves will just uh, have no emotional reaction to it or won't have a reaction that you think that they would have. And then I think the, the last two things, so compulsive behaviors or ritualistic behaviors, very simple, repetitive motor behaviors, so tapping or um, clicking um, clicking their mouth, or um, uh, some people will have even complex hobbies that they develop out of nowhere. Uh, so that's kind of a change, like why is somebody taking on a complex new hobby that's very focused, that they're kind of more obsessed about late in life? Um, what, what are some examples of, of <laughs> hobbies like that, that people sometimes? Well, I mean, sometimes you will, it's um, sometimes will be of a religious nature. So one example sticks out to me is I, I had a patient that would um, uh, go into their backyard and find ants and uh, kill the ants and keep detailed logs of all of the ants that mm. uh, had been killed or sometimes from the obsessive point of view um, or perseverative point of view, uh, somebody will go through and, and pick up individual crumbs off of the table after every meal, and they can't get up from the table unless they've picked up every crumb uh, individually off the, the table. Uh, other examples would be somebody eating the same meal from the same restaurant at the same time every single day. Sometimes it will be new religious beliefs. Um, and then from a, a craving hyperorality point of view, people have become new new onset alcoholic, uh, sorry, alcohol use disorder out of out of nowhere as well. So and cho chocolate, like just consuming uh, large quantities of chocolate where that wasn't their habit. But you, I think some of those examples you described are uh, help to explain why with a younger onset, without necessarily a lot of other neurological symptoms, many patients initially with frontotemporal dementia are referred to psychiatrists because they have these new emotional and personality and behavior changes that are very unusual and uncharacteristic without there necessarily being any other obvious neurologic findings or memory problems even initially. There are instances kind of talking about the more complex, higher order processing, the executive function. There are instances where people just have complete personality changes or some of the, the more psychiatric kind of symptoms and won't have any dis-executive function um, to, to begin with. So yeah, your point is definitely well taken. And when we're describing these stories to people, I think our audience can appreciate how different that these symptoms are and presentations are from uh, the other dementias when it's more kind of memory and basic thinking. It's much different. Um, a much different flavor. And I should say, you know, people do go undiagnosed for a long period yeah. of time. 
I think it's getting better now that people are becoming more familiar with the, the frontotemporal dementias, but, um, but that's it. And, and, and actually as a, as a psychiatrist, I think sometimes we uh, will characterize patients with frontal lobe syndromes, whether from a frontotemporal dementia or not as kind of, do they, do they seem to have characteristics more like depression or mania or a bit of both? Uh, again, as you said, sometimes people look like they're depressed. They have a lot of apathy. They're not uh, seeming to get pleasure in things that used to give them pleasure. They're not mode. They don't seem motivated or initiating things. And sometimes they look the opposite. They seem to be really disinhibited and inappropriate and hypersexual, things that we sometimes see with mania from the psychiatric standpoint. And sometimes they have a, a, a mix of both of these things. So again, some of these psychiatric uh, symptoms or syndromes are quite common in, in the frontotemporal dementias and um, people with frontal lobe involvement from other dementias. Uh, maybe just quickly say a little bit, I mean, we we sometimes talk about the causes or causes or at least the association of what's going on um, in Alzheimer's disease. We think of the toxic protein of beta amyloid affecting the brain. In many of the frontotemporal dementias, it's a different toxic protein called uh, tau that seems to affect uh, the front part of the brain. Um, I don't know if, if you want to talk a bit about that uh, or just maybe talk a little bit about the, the range of different frontotemporal dementias. Yeah. Um, so the, the beta amyloid that you talked about, the beta 42 is thought to be the toxic related protein in Alzheimer's disease. And there's a specific type of tau that you can look at and identify under the microscope, which is related to Alzheimer's disease as well. And there's a separate set of proteins that seem to want to impact the front part of the brain uh, in a, a different way. It's more selective and they impact generally the front part of the brain, which causes these, um, this group of disorders. And so the tau that we look at and see in frontotemporal dementia looks different than the tau we see in Alzheimer's. Mm. There's also additional um, uh, protein which is called TDP43, which is a, another common cause of these problems. There are other proteins, but that I think is beyond the scope of this talk because it gets to be very, very complicated uh, quite, a, uh, quite quickly. And so you have our, this behavioral variant. So um, the umbrella term of these proteins that tend to impact the front part of the brain are called frontotemporal lobar degeneration. And the disorders that kind of group together would be behavioral variant frontotemporal dementia from a pure dementia point of view. There are two language variants. One is called semantic variant, primary progressive aphasia. The other one is a non-fluent variant. Um, and then uh, two movement disorders, so cortical basilar syndrome and progressive supranuclear palsy. And uh, finally, motor neuron disease. So there's a, quite a significant overlap with uh, FTD and um, ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease. So yeah, that was a lot of a lot of information and long words and long uh, right. diagnoses there. Uh, but I think it's it's fair to say there's uh, the the prominent behavioral variant frontotemporal dementia and also ones that seem to affect uh, language very early on. And when we talk about the primary progressive aphasia, what that means is that's one of the variants where people generally have a younger onset. And it tends to uh, happen very quickly that they lose uh, their speech and language early on in the in the course of the dementia. It might be the only characteristic that they have. So they their memory and thinking is completely intact. Their visual spatial function is intact, but they they cannot get the word. So the non fluent variant is when it's halting and stuttering. There's a breakdown of grammar in their their speech. Um, their understanding might be impaired to a certain degree as well in more complex sentences. And the semantic variant is that you lose object understanding and knowledge. So you look at a cup and you might think it's an object, you know, uh, used for drinking, and then it might just become a thing or a, a lion would become an animal, which is less specific. And then uh, it would just become a thing. You, you can't name things and you don't understand what their purposes are. And then 
the movement disorders we described kind of mimic that people's muscles might get a bit rigid, they might develop tremors, and there might be some other features. And so it's in keeping with a Parkinson's type of, of disease, which people will see. And um, it, it is a complicated group of disorders, and there's overlap, which I yeah. think is frustrating for individuals as well. I've seen people that will get vague diagnoses, and so it frustrates them. So, you know, we don't bring up all of these complex words to confuse people, but just saying if they're hearing these words when they're going to various doctors, there is a relation between them. And I think another thing that's frustrating for people is that you can start start off as having one of the disorders that looks quite clear, like a non-fluent variant language disorder, um, and then it can evolve over time to get more of the personality and behavior issues or it can evolve over time to develop some, um, the motor issues. So looking more like a Parkinson's disorder. So, so we've got some great questions that I, I think will help us circle back and review some of these concepts. So why don't, why don't I go to a few of the questions now, and then maybe we'll come back to a few other um, things around say diagnosis and treatment, but uh, some great questions here that I think will help to underscore uh, some of the background we've been discussing. So the, the first is, can you tell me anything about progressive supranuclear palsy or PSP? And maybe just situate that again into the, you were just talking about some of the frontotemporal dementias that might have movement disorders. So maybe explain progressive supranuclear palsy a little bit. Right. So uh, the major finding that um, you have in progressive supranuclear palsy is that people can't lose voluntary control over their eye movements. So sometimes, sometimes you can have nerve damage or muscle damage, which will prevent people from moving their eyes in various directions. And this just means that the front, the front part of the brain, which is responsible for allowing you to move them, gets cut off from the rest of, of the, the brain in that sense. And so people have difficulties looking up or looking down and some of the eye reflexes are impaired. People can also get very stiff bodies. So not only when they're walking around where their eyes be fixed in one position, they can't look up and down, but they're now fixed in a, a very stiff, rigid um, position um, because, uh, because of the body rigidity that they have. So they're very prone to early falls. And also they'll have the muscle stiffness and slowness of movement that other uh, Parkinson's related disorders can have. Um, and then finally, difficulties with swallowing or speaking can sometimes happen early. And it's quite a dangerous condition just because people do have early and severe falls because you can't move your eyes and you're really rigid. So your postural writing reflexes are very uh, impaired and they tend to fall and can fall backwards quite severely because of the rigidity as well. Um, here's a sorry, go ahead. Oh, Was I, there anything else? Okay. No, that's, no, that was it. For that. Um, I'm just uh, conscious of trying to get through a lot of the really good questions. So, yeah. um, so here's here's a, a question, and then a couple follow ups, and I think it it might be helpful to read all of it first. So, are those who have frontotemporal dementia aware of the changes that are happening uh, with them? For example, personality changes, how they respond to others, and perhaps losing uh, their filter for social norms. And uh, so that was that was the sort of opening series of questions. And then some of the follow up ones, uh, do some uh, frontotemporal dementia patients become fixated on a certain topic? The person I'm concerned about is frequently making sexual innuendos about almost anything, a comment, a commercial, an emotional experience. This person tends to be very frequently making sexual comments or innuendos. And in these cases, it's sometimes out of the blue. Um, so great, great questions. Um, and go ahead, you can, uh, so I guess starting with the beginning one about being aware of the changes. Yeah, so generally we'll describe the awareness of one's deficits to be insight. So if you're aware, you have insight into the conditions you have and the, the consequences of your actions and more frequently than not, much more frequently than not, people with um, frontotemporal related personality changes don't have awareness. And that's part of your awareness is kind of embedded within your frontal lobe. So if there's damage there, more frequently they won't understand it because 
if they did understand, then they probably would have some capacity to hold it back, but it, it just comes out and, uh, and, and they don't, they're not aware of uh, how harmful it is, or they can't appreciate the impact that their behavior is having on other people. Um, from the and I, yeah, and I think that's why it ties in so well with the the next one. So yes, um, many patients with uh, frontotemporal dementias do become fixated on a certain topic, uh, have trouble changing the topic, and then couple that with the inability to filter yes. and the inappropriateness. So uh, what you describe uh, about the you know sexual innuendos, sexually inappropriate comments, and not necessarily being able to inhibit or stop from making those is uh, really, uh, unfortunately, one of the characteristic uh, signs that people often see with frontotemporal dementia. Um, another question, is there any particular connection between frontotemporal dementia and difficulty managing financial affairs. My husband's in the early stages of frontotemporal dementia, and I'm having trouble assessing if he should still be managing our investments. I'm monitoring our accounts, and there have been no problems so far. What are the danger signs? Um, so yes, we mentioned the association with um, executive function problems. It doesn't mean just because you have uh, behavioral variant frontotemporal dementia doesn't mean that you're absolutely will have them early on in the course. And so I think it's important to just watch the finances and see if bills have been paid twice or bills are not being paid. Um, having discussions with your accountant on whether there's been mistakes made with respect to um, tax filing. Um, uh, I think from a disinhibited disinhibition point of view as well, if they um, looking for large transfers, because sometimes um, the um, you know the people that are trying to take advantage of uh, older adults, um, or even younger adults in this case, um, you lose the appreciation to detect when somebody's trying to take advantage of you. So sometimes large sums of money can go missing um, in kind of the phishing schemes that happen I, over email or you know the, let's say the the CRA tax fraud kind of issues where you have to call the CRA right away because you've, you know, you're at risk of um, uh, doing something illegal. So I, I think it was uh, monitoring your bank accounts is reasonable monitoring um, kind of what's happening with your accountants and just, just seeing what's happening with day-to-day -day transactions is fine. And then if you're talking with your doctor and they've noted a big decline in um, the cognitive testing side of things from, um, from that point of view, there's been a, a decline in scores or on certain um, test parts of the test, then, then they should be able to tell you that, you know, it's time to pack it in with respect to managing finance. I think, I think there's a lot of great points you brought up there, uh, Richard, though, because there, there may not be cognitive issues with some of the math or the calculations involved in managing the financial affairs, but the nature of frontotemporal dementia and some of the other challenges like disinhibition, um, making, you know, potentially having trouble with, with uh, calculating risks and benefits uh, um, make, make mean there are other reasons why the person could be vulnerable to financial mismanagement. And um, obviously it's a, it's a very, challenging domain sometimes in terms of the um, wanting to continue to foster independence and autonomy in the person living with the dementia and the dynamic in the couple. But I think there are, um, you know, I think your approach is sensible in terms of monitoring accounts and, and keeping a close eye on things. Uh, is constantly making verbal sounds such as uh, grunting, blowing air, vibrating lips, etc all part of dementia. The person is not aware that this is happening. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm gonna say that uh, it, it would depend a little bit more on some of the context here. Um, some, some of those kinds of uh, symptoms or vocalizations may be seen in people who have um, brain injuries from other causes like acquired brain injuries or um, if they are newly developed in conjunction with a dementia, then they are potentially related to 
uh, to the dementia itself. Uh, but uh, I don't know if you have any other thoughts about this this particular question. Yeah, I mean, um, <clears throat> I think you make great points. And um, like in advanced Alzheimer's disease, where it's spreading from the back and finally the entire brain is involved, you'll see uh, highly repetitive vocalizations or stereotyped yeah. behaviors. And so kind of your contextual remarks, like has somebody had memory and thinking problems and uh, executive problems and uh, visual spatial problems for a long period of time, and they've been diagnosed with Alzheimer's, and then they're developing these repetitive vocalizations, or is it happening very early in a younger patient that has the other associated personality and behavior changes as their first symptoms? And so mm -hmm. yes, absolutely, and brain damage, whether it's from trauma or whether it's from neurodegenerative disease, can result in these symptoms. Um, putting it in its appropriate context with all of the other symptoms and age and medical conditions is also appropriate uh, as well. I'm trying to think of like there's, there's tick disorders that sometimes people may have with no cognitive impairment that cause these, these symptoms as well. So the, the types of patients that I've seen generally with those uh, types of vocalizations or behaviors, actually I would say are often uh, born with some form of uh, intellectual disability and uh, they may have had some of these behaviors um, at a at a younger age, but they might they might get worse uh, over time with uh, with worsening cognitive impairment. Um, does frontal lobe changes or do frontal lobe changes cause depression? And is it associated with uh, normal pressure hydrocephalus or NPH? Yeah, so there's a really strong association between, you know, we talk about the frontal lobes and the gray matter that's on the outside and the white matter that's underneath. So there's a strong association between the white matter damage in the frontal lobe and um, depression and also areas within the frontal lobe. So the subcortical regions, part of the caudate. So that's the, um, if there's atrophy there, that that's associated with depression as well. So yes, the frontal lobes can modulate to a very significant degree or mood and damage to the frontal lobes can be associated with um, depression. And uh, from a normal pressure hydrocephalus point of view, so that's what there's these holes in your brain called ventricles that hold fluid called cerebrospinal fluid. And if the drainage mechanisms um, or production mechanisms are out of sync, then you'll accumulate this uh, fluid and it kind of puts pressure on the brain and that can cause some damage. And, the, the type of dementia that's caused by normal pressure hydrocephalus is more of a executive function related problem um, and is also associated with certain walking abnormalities. Uh, so people's feet will get stuck to the ground or have a magnetic gait and they'll have increased urinary urgency or frequency or um, incontinence. And so you can help distinguish that based on the fact that there's not a lot of the strong personality and behavior or interpersonal warmth problems and there's early incontinence or urgency and gait or walking abnormalities so it's a bit of a different a different disorder do you think that's accurate i mean you know more a lot about depression yeah no i i think that i think the i think that's right on point and i, I think one of the other challenges around uh, we don't really know 100% what causes depression, um, but we definitely see some association between some of, there's some overlap between symptoms that we see in depression and symptoms we see in people with damage to the frontal lobes. And, you know, from a causal standpoint, people who have uh, strokes in the frontal lobes have a higher risk of developing uh, depression in vascular dementia. But keep in mind what we were talking about too, sometimes the symptoms of frontal lobe changes can look quite a bit like depression without there necessarily being a depressed mood or some of the other symptoms. So they may have more of the you know, lack of initiation or apathy, lack of emotionality, but they're not necessarily experiencing sadness or necessarily experiencing other changes to sleep or appetite or feeling suicidal at all. So uh, there is that sort of uh, overlap between um, frontal lobe symptoms and depressive symptoms that can look, one can look like the other. So. Um, this, this viewer writes in, this seems very applicable to what I face with fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue, 
chronic fatigue syndrome. Is there a link or science on that aspect? Um, and I, I, I guess I would just say, I don't know if you have any other comment, but that again, there's, there's definitely some overlap uh, between different syndromes that might affect the frontal lobes or where the frontal lobes may be involved. Uh, we don't have a very good understanding of fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, so the science behind uh, those conditions is, is poorly understood. Is it multiple different conditions? Is it a, a similar common pathway, but the causes might be different? Um, in, in those conditions, to my knowledge, there, there aren't necessarily toxic proteins like tau proteins uh, involved in many cases an underlying uh, positive diagnosis or cause can't necessarily be found, uh, but some of the effects that it might have in terms of um, the effects on emotions or um, some of the, the behaviors and emotions, there can be some overlap, but I don't know if you have any other thoughts on that. Uh, I bet you, I think we're just in our infancy and I, I'm not an expert in either one of those conditions, but I think, um, you know, before fibromyalgia was thought to be more of a psychologic disorder. And when they study CSF levels of various proteins, there's abnormalities. So I just, I think probably we just don't understand them quite well enough, but I would, I would echo all everything that you're saying. They're quite distinct and different from neurodegenerative conditions, but I'm sure they have a kind of indirect impact on your cognition in a global sense. If you're in pain all of the time and you have yeah. poor attention and you're not sleeping well and, and things like that. Um, and I think that's a good point. There's, there's more evidence around certain uh, interventions like cognitive behavioral therapy, physical activity, exercise, uh, showing a benefit in uh, fibromyalgia and cr chronic fatigue, whereas that is not usually the case in a progressive neurodegenerative uh, case. So we have a, a question from Halifax here. Uh, can an MRI or a CT scan help to diagnose frontotemporal dementia? I think this is a good opportunity to talk a little bit about uh, diagnosis and, and the role of imaging. Yeah, I, I think everything um, has its place. So you, you're always thinking of, you know, what's the age of the patient and how does that shift your likelihood of diagnosis? The presenting symptoms that they have uh, so whether they're more personality related and or whether they're more kind of memory related and then when you, uh, the other investigations you can order like blood work we talk about that quite a lot and then when you get to the imaging side of things mri can be quite helpful for a few reasons one is that it can show you shrinking uh, or atrophy of certain parts of the brain and if the frontal lobes are impacted and you see they're smaller uh, in compared to other regions of the brain and the spe specific other parts like the insula, the anterior cingulate, um, and the orbital frontal, the very front bottom part. So you can look for very specific areas for the shrinking that takes place. And for instance, if I looked at that and I saw the temporal lobes were very small or the hippocampi, which are impacted in Alzheimer's, were a lot smaller, then that would shift me to thinking that, you know, it, it could have been Alzheimer's related. There are more research related tests and in, in the States, in the United States, they use them kind of more frequently, but you can tag certain proteins and look at them in PET scanning um, to see whether there's actually amyloid present or not, which is part of, uh, which is the, um, the protein related to Alzheimer's disease. So that can sometimes, that could be helpful if you could get access to that test, because if it is there and you think that more of the symptoms were related to uh, to Alzheimer's disease. There are also um, kind of metabolism tests that you can do like um, to see which parts of the, the brain are using glucose more. So if there's a lot more damage in certain parts of the frontal lobe, then that kind of helps you to think um, that your diagnosis is more, more likely. So um, yeah. the other, the other thing to keep in mind too, is that sometimes the uh, brain imaging, like an MRI or a CT might be useful to rule out other potential causes of the symptoms the person is experiencing. Uh, you know, there, there are large tumors that can sometimes ap ap appear in the frontal lobes, things like meningioma, or, you know, did somebody have um, subdurals or damage from typically from trauma that might be affecting the frontal lobe. So there's a role for imaging uh, in those cases too. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Uh, does having REM sleep disorder predispose you to getting or having dementia, or can it be a harbinger or a sign of dementia? Yeah, it's it can be a harbinger, but more likely related to um, Lewy body related disorders. So Parkinson's disease is caused by Lewy bodies. Uh, alpha synuclein is the protein. Um, dementia with Lewy bodies is caused by that and something called multi system atrophy. So um, if you have REM sleep disorder and you follow somebody out for 10 or 15 years, about 64% of them will develop um, Parkinson's disease. And if you follow them out for even longer, up to 80% of people will develop it. So REM sleep disorder can be a harbinger uh, for, uh, for people to develop um, the Lewy body related disorders, not as as far as I'm aware, not related to Alzheimer's, not related to vascular okay. dementia, and not related to the frontotemporal dementias. And it's and, used as a supportive diagnostic criteria yeah. for dementia with Lewy body. So if you have it, and you have hallucinations and fluctuations in your level of consciousness and um, Parkinsonism, then it, it's helpful to point you that um, to to clinch the diagnosis. And, and actually, one of the things that uh, uh, Dr. Stramko and I were thinking uh, after this is maybe we'll we'll do a series of uh, deeper dives like today's live event on some of the other types of dementia. Uh, so we'll, um, we'll, like the next question that came in was, are these dementias part of Lewy body dementia? And no, we tend to distinguish between the frontotemporal dementias and dementia with Lewy bodies, but there's definitely a relationship between uh, dementia with Lewy bodies and Parkinson disease dementia. So I think we'll we'll do one of our future live events and we'll do a bit of a deeper dive on uh, dementia with Lewy bodies and Parkinson disease dementia. I think um, so point to those, uh, those people to the different types of dementia lessons, because as you'll see this, I mean, the stories that we tell and the stories that the patients come in and start telling are, are quite different or can be quite different. So it's helpful to go through that that lesson to help tease apart some of those questions you might be having. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the lesson is entitled the the different types of dementia, and you can um, learn more about the various types, or if you wanted to just select. Now we do only cover some of the most common categories. I think the five largest sort of ca categories of the dementias. So, uh, my husband has primary progressive aphasia, non-fluent. Uh, tell caregivers to make sure the power of attorney or executor designations are in place. My my husband can no longer even sign his name. So I think this is a, a an excellent point. Thank you very much for uh, submitting that because you know we we do talk about in uh, our upcoming new uh, e learning lesson on the stages of dementia, but in some of the other ones and our live event talking about uh, capacity or uh, end of life care. It's really important, especially with the younger onset dementias to start thinking early about advanced care planning and things like um, sorting out uh, power of attorney documents and, and wills. So um, I, I think that's a great point. Any, any other comments, Rich? I, I think often in the, pro, pro, the primary progressive aphasias, that type of frontotemporal dimension, the, the onset can be quite quick. So, uh, and, and the, like the progression can be quick, especially that the parent would, uh, the person might lose their, um, their language early on. So uh, probably even more important to get, get some of those uh, important things together. Yeah, I think, I think you're right. If it, they break down in your uh, ability to communicate is one of the first things that goes down. It doesn't matter what's happening with the rest of the brain. If you can't communicate what your wishes and goals and, and needs are. So I think that's something that we, we struggle with too, is that when you've given somebody a diagnosis and sometimes it's earlier on in their um, illness and their younger patients, uh, it's a lot to take in. And so um, sometimes people will shy away from talking about, well, what are, what are your end of life goals and who's your power of attorney? And do you have wills in place and things like that? But uh, it's important, I think, after giving people time to cope with the initial diagnosis to not too far down the road, like quite quickly is start talking about some of those, those other issues because people will get caught off guard uh, at a later, at a later 
time when they don't have those things in place. I think too, oh, just mentioning, sorry, go ahead. Um, you know, a lot of times there's a bit of referral patterns that happen. So I'm a geriatrician. I tend to see older adults that have complex medical uh, disorders. And there's a certain type of patient with dementia that will get referred to me. Oftentimes there are neurolo the neurologists will see, or perhaps the neuropsychiatrists will see the younger patients that have the frontotemporal dementias, or they may present to a movement disorder clinic because the, this muscle stiffness or tremor is something that happens. Um, quite frequently. And because they are complicated disorders to tease out, sometimes, you know, I'm uh, quite confident in dealing with many different types of dementia, but, you know, if somebody is looking to get genetic testing done, or they want a little bit more diagnostic clarity, I might send them to Baycrest in Toronto, where they have a whole um, frontotemporal dementia program put in place, and they see high volumes of it. So I think that's something to make people aware of also. Yes. If they're not confident or comfortable with their diagnosis, perhaps getting a referral um, to uh, to somebody who sees it, frontotemporal dementias more frequently, um, it, it can be a good idea. And then, and the final, I think, reason to do that is if people want to participate in research. So I think that's something where you know it offers a, a people the sense that they can do something, or they have some form of control, or they want to give back. Uh, to society and feel like they're contributing. Um, and, and absolutely, people do contribute a lot through research. So I think that there's a few reasons to get people involved in these kind of tertiary or quaternary centers uh, if they have one of the, the FTD kind of. That, that's an that's a excellent point on both fronts. One, I think most provinces will have uh, at least one major center uh, that is involved in research or has a, a clinic that has more experience uh, around uh, frontotemporal dementias. Um, and then also just the, the point about getting involved in clinical research. And actually we talked about maybe doing a live event where we talk a little bit about um, clinical research in terms of both an update, but also, you know, what are some of the ways that people could get involved if they were interested, so. So I, I really, I want to thank uh, Dr. Stramko and all of our viewers for um, posting some outstanding questions today uh, on a really interesting topic. Um, our next live event is scheduled for Thursday, January 28th, 2021. Um, I think we'll all be glad to see the back of 2020 uh, get through this. I hope everybody has a, a safe and healthy uh, holiday period. Some uh, people, especially in our group, other uh, care providers or uh, older adults or people um, who are vulnerable may be in line for uh, vaccine distribution in the coming months. Uh, the survey is pinned at the top of the comments section. You know, please give us feedback. Let us know what topics you'd like for uh, future broadcasts. Uh, again, iGerry Care was developed with support from the Canadian Centre for Aging and Brain Health Brain Health Innovation, powered by Baycrest, uh, the Jarris Center at Hamilton Health Sciences, McMaster University, the Hamilton Health Sciences Foundation, the Alzheimer's Society Foundation of Hamilton Halton, and uh, our team at the Division of E-Learning Innovation, uh, working remotely from home. Uh, just a reminder that uh, if you like what we're doing, and uh, we have added actually a new lesson, or we'll be adding it imminently, hopefully before the holidays on the stages, of uh, dementia, uh, there's a donate button in the top right of the igericare.ca site, and we really appreciate uh, any funding that can continue to support the initiative. Um, we're really grateful to everybody. I I thank everybody for participating and watching it. And uh, again, a really uh, safe and what's been a difficult year and a difficult holiday, but uh, hope people can enjoy some time off and uh, we look forward to connecting with you again in the new year. Uh, as always, teamwork makes the dream work. Thanks everybody and thank you Richard. I'd just like to say thank you Anthony actually for <laughs> ending off this year. Thank you for uh, leading the whole division of e-learning and uh, making all of these events possible because if you didn't have such a big team, obviously everybody at the division of e-learning, but if you didn't have such a big team to put this uh, together, and if you hadn't put in so much work to have the whole division of e-learning, then none of this would be possible. So 
thank you very much for all the hard work and dedication to, to making all of this uh, possible. Thank you very much, Richard. And have a great holiday, you and your family. You too. Take care. Okay. Bye, everybody.